Thanks for the nice introduction. That means that we can skip already this. And um, my name is Marion. I'm a laptop player and graphic designer. I studied architecture. And um, my first instrument was the piano and my first steps in performing I did with a bunch of electronic uh, devices like drum computers and synthesizers. Uh, hi, I'm Marcin Szlejewski, I'm guitarist and composer and we're making together music for the last 12 years in different fields, as Jan mentioned before. And um, we got into this uh, sound archaeologic research uh, for, uh, w during a commission that we got for a um, composition for, a, for the grand organ at the St. Peter Church in Cologne, which is a very specific uh, organ. You can see this is like the half of the pipes of the organ. There is another set on the other side of the church. It's kind of a stereo effect that you get from this uh, organ, and it has uh, very specific um, features. For example, it's uh, it's made of uh, pipes from different centuries, from uh, like really old Renaissance uh, organ, but also it has registers uh, or sounds that were used in uh, cinema organs in the 20s, like a Wurlitzer, like you have here in the Babylon. Um, it has very specific pipes that, that the person uh, who uh, designed this organ especially made for this organ to be able to perform modern uh, music on it. And uh, what was very important for this project was it uh, has a MIDI interface. So you can just go with your laptop there, plug in, and you can play the whole uh, organ, which every register, which every sound um, from the computer, and you can change the sounds very quickly, like no organ player could do. Uh, and what we did there was like connecting this uh, wonderful instrument with uh, um, with this uh, installation that was there. So there was an installation from a Belgium uh, architects. All these squares could uh, move and rotate and uh, we translated the movements of this installation into the sounds of the organ. And during doing this, uh, it struck us very hard that it's, there's such a strong uh, connection between an organ and a synthesizer and that it's really worth to explore it. Uh, what we found there is also was a um, person, the Gerhard Kern, who is an instrument builder, and uh, that's uh, that was like the start of our going into the machine work. So Gerhard was working with uh, punch card instruments uh, that you probably know from uh, draw, uh, barrel organs. Uh, and he, uh, he he built huge instruments that he then uh, started to modernize in a way that instead of using punch cards, he started to using a media interface too, so you can control it completely from a computer. Yes, and um, so we went deeper into the history of music machines and experimental music uh, in 2013 with the project Avon Avantgarde. Um, we did this with a friend of us, uh, Michał Libera, he is located in Warsaw. And um, the project we did with uh, about 50 musicians in four cities in Cologne, Berlin, Warsaw and Krakow. And uh, we were going back to the uh, roots of experimental music. And uh, one thing was also like the demystification of the myth of the like the new of the new music and contemporary music of the uh, 20th century, and we discovered a lot of phenomena that were rooted much more uh, deeper in history than expected, and. Um, our aim for this project was like to create and to build uh, a music machine for each event, but uh, it was very, then it turned out that it was much more challenging and um, we ended up at least uh, with three instruments that we built over the course of uh, the whole project. And this was also like the start of our Ensemble Gamund Inc. 
And um, these are the first two instruments we built. On the left side, it's, uh, it's called Carillon, and on the right side, uh, the first version of the Bojo. And we will talk about this in detail later. Um, this was uh, one performance at Berghain. It was dedicated to the phenomena of uh, Giuseppe Tartini. It's about the combination tones. We will also talk about this a little bit more later. And this was our setup in 2013 with the music machines. In the end, uh, the Polish magazine Glissando dedicated what was really very nice an um, issue to the theme and to all the things we discovered over the course because we couldn't present all these theories uh, on stage within like the performances. And we thought like, wow, there's all this material and all this knowledge. And um, we wanted to let uh, at least know a few people more about it. And I mean, at least the magazine is there and we could collect a lot of our thoughts. And uh, what we found out, or what maybe you can uh, cook it down to, that there are two, um, two ways to see the history of uh, automation of music, and, uh, and they relate to two aspects of music. It's like <clears throat> one is the automation of sound itself, and one is the automation, like you have a modern loud, you, the automation is the loudspeaker, or you have the... Um, automation of the composition process itself, which is uh, represented by algorithmic composition. And we're going to give you a brief uh, history about uh, the automation of music. So uh, when we think of this, uh, as I mentioned before, you, you think of this uh, barrel organs that you see at fairs. Uh, but the history is much deeper. Actually, it goes back to ancient Greek. And what you see here in this picture is a uh, uh, are moving doors that the ancient Greek had, and they had this hidden uh, apparatus be below temples. Uh, there is this fireplace that generates steam that uh, moves a chain, and the chain can then open and close like magically the temple doors. And they had it already like 100 before Christ, as uh, Heron von Alexandria uh, describes in his Automata book. They had actually a lot of kinetic sculptures like that. For example, flute players that could perform melodies or birds or statues that could move an arm or something like this. And um, this is, um, it's, it was seen a little bit as a kitsch by the higher classes, you know, to use this technology for, uh, for art. And therefore, it's uh, someday it also disappeared again. But we'll come back to this uh, later. Uh, what we also found really interesting were prede predecessors to um, field recordings, concrete music, or um, also to sound effects. Uh, what you see here is a, a rain machine. These machines came up in the Baroque theaters, and they were hidden behind the stage also, like the um, like the, the temple door uh, mechanism that you've seen before, uh, either below the stage or some behind a curtain. And they could create a, a huge amount of uh, different sounds like wind, rain, thunder. It was a whole um, arsenal of sound effects that could be used to create the illusion of um, being actually on a ship or whatever. Um, one guy we also discovered, uh, he accompanied us for a longer term, it, he's called Athanasius Kircher. He, it's a 17th century polymath, and um, so we want to show you only one thing of his various collection of ideas and uh, apparatus. It's called uh, the Arca Musa Rhythmica. And you call, can call it most probably the first algorithmic um, composition machine. And um, it's a wooden box filled with uh, cue cards. And um, you can combine four part canonic pieces with it. So, and there are written down also um, specific moods and timbres, and um, it's kind of similar to the idea of uh, a loop library. 
And uh, between the 17th and the 20th century, uh, it was uh, really like a boom of building uh, music machines. So there are only a few we will show you. It's, um, for example, this flute clock for which Mozart and Beethoven did compositions. And uh, the bigger one, which I think is more famous, it's the orchestrion. It's um, like big wooden cupboards filled with a whole ensemble of instruments. And um, there's a smaller version of an orchestrion. And uh, then the most famous one um, is the pianola, also known as the player piano. And the player piano is the instrument which is already uh, still existing now. And um, Conlan Nencaro, for example, he did a lot of his complex compositions for punch card pianolas, for example. And with the newer edition of the player pianos, you can also record like the mood of playing. So you can not only play back like uh, the notes, but also like, for example, Glenn Gould played his piece. Um, yes, now we step back much deeper again into okay. history. <laughs> yeah, obviously, all these uh, inventions uh, kind of became obsolete with the invention of the loudspeaker, where you could rec recreate whole orchestras in your living room. So uh, they kind of disappeared and, and just stayed as a kind of a obscurities, um, except this player piano that Mar Mario mentioned. And, uh, if we go back now again and, and think about the history of uh, sound design more than history of um, automation, uh, one figure that is uh, at the beginning of the history that we know is Pythagoras, who you can see here at this monochord instrument. It's uh, actually it's a polychord because it has many strings, but originally it's an instrument that is just a wooden box with a string on it, and uh, it was uh, both uh, an instrument for physical measuring and uh, an instrument for musical uh, creation. So. Um, what he does here is he divides the string by a number of two or number of three or number of or four or a higher number. And he developed a whole theory around this divisions of the string uh, that for him related to the movement of the planets or the whole universe. And the simpler the number was, in his opinion, the more harmonic it was. Uh, so basically what he discovered here is the theory of the overtones that we still use and that you you still um, find when you play a guitar or flageolets or whatever. And uh, so this is a very uh, important figure for all kinds of sound research thing. But also it is said that he was not the first one who discovered it, but he got this knowledge from some ancient um, Egypt, uh, Egyptian priests. So uh, this knowledge of divisions of a string or of um, frequency is seems to be like we very, very very old in human history and uh, we're gonna make a huge jump now to the uh, 18th century with a very important figure who is Chladni. Uh, he was a German physicist and a musician who was uh, probably the first one to visualize sound waves and he did so by um, applying um, to, to putting sand on um, very thin plates of uh, metal or of glass and striking them with a bow. What you can see here is, uh, is a pattern occurs when he strikes the um, plate and the pattern is related to also the overtone of the, of the plate that is resonating. So the plate can resonate either in its own frequency, like you probably know that each body has its own resonant frequency, uh, but the pattern changes depending on where you, uh, similar to like dividing a string, you can kind of divide the plate by touching it at one point, and then you get overtone resonances of this plate. And so you get like very fantastic uh, patterns out of this, which uh, he uh, found out. And yeah, here you can see different patterns for different overtone structures that occur. And they're always the same, depend it doesn't matter how big the plate is, so it's something very um, int interesting to um, 
uh, to frequency. And he became really famous with this uh, visualization, with this show. Yeah, it was basically a, a show. He would play for uh, Napoleon Bonaparte and travel through whole Europe and became like the first multimedia artist, maybe. Yeah? <laughs> um, Another very important figure for the history of sound is uh, Helmholtz, uh, who is uh, 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 also 19th century um, physician, and uh, he uh, he was doing a lot of experiments, for example, with tuning forks. So he would take a tuning fork, uh, which was the, the purest sound that uh, he could find at his uh, time. Uh, because he was obsessed of like um, getting the sound to its very core, like very radical idea of um, that the sound is uh, uh, combined of um, waves that are like sine waves. So he was the kind of the uh, the one who proved it right that it's uh, possible to uh, s separate each sound into its own. Um, uh, elements which are the sine waves, and he did so by having this uh, tuning forks uh, tuned in different um, frequencies and striking them not with a like you like you would hit a tuning uh, tuning fork against a table or whatever, but he would use electromagnets uh, which were a very hot thing at his time, and uh, by doing so, so the electromagnets uh, get the tuning fork to vibrate. You don't get an attack on this tuning fork, so you get a very clear um, note. That is uh, that has no attack, and he wanted to synthesize uh, the vowels of the human speech with his tuning forks, which he succeeded almost completely, except the I. The I was has too much of uh, dissonant resonances to be synthesized. But you can say that he created the first synthesizer, which was not used for music but for physical research. But it's a very basic uh, research that he did for this. Um, so I think the next is uh, yeah, Giuseppe Tartini, the Italian violin player, composer, and music theorist. So he was the one who discovered the combination tones. They are also called Tartini tones. And uh, it's a phenomena that um, the ear like works like kind of a transducer. So uh, if a violin player plays a double stop, so you can not only hear the tones which are actually be played or performed, there is an additional frequency that you hear. And uh, Tartini discovered this, and he did a lot of composition and compositions and violin concerts uh, about this phenomena. And there is also one story about his most famous piece, um, the Devil's Trill Sonata, that he had a dream, and the devil on the bed was uh, on his bed was playing the violin, and um, he heard like a composition uh, from the devil, and uh, he woke up and immediately started to work on the composition. But he said himself it was his best composition he ever did, but it was not as good as the piece he could hear in his dream played by the devil. So, um, yeah, from Tartini to some discoveries in, ah, yeah, this is one picture done about the situation. Um, this is an instrument, it's a Vietnamese instrument, it's called uh, Kni. And um, it's an, a string instrument, and uh, it sounds like this talk box, talk box effect. So the player modulates a resonant uh, box attached to the string. Um, it's very interesting that, 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 like in folklore music, you find a lot of uh, f sound effects and um, like uh, modulations that you would not find in like classical music or so. So this is yeah, like really yeah. Um, then this is uh, an old uh, woman rotating a pan. Uh, she's um, obviously from Bosnia and Herzegovina, and the technique is called tepsiania. 
and uh, it happened that uh, this uh, it's a rural rural tradition uh, only um, practiced by women and one woman was rotating like a specific pan in a specific uh, size and another woman was like singing into this pan and then there was like this uh, vibrato effect and um, you can see this like kind of a predecessor of what Stockhausen um, did with his rotating table in the end it's about it's the same idea and um, it's also like the same effect uh, like you can find uh, in the Leslie speaker, which was invented in the 40s, I think, by Don Leslie in the United States. Um, so let's back turn now to the organ again, I think. Okay. Uh, this is one more picture uh, of how the Leslie speaker can be built of these speakers which are rotating. And, uh, yeah. Okay, so I said before that the invention of the loudspeaker kind of made all this uh, automata um, obsolete, but which is not completely true because uh, they stayed some uh, of these inventions and these ideas of how to produce a sound, for example, in the organ, which was called the queen of the instruments, and which is uh, many knowledge kind of came into this organ. It's a, um, and uh, I want to kind of so you uh, explain in which way it, it relates to electronic music for, for me. It's like, um, uh, like in electronic music, each organ is a very different animal. It's a very specific instrument that is built by people who, um, who have a specific idea of how the sounds should sound like. It's, uh, it's like in electronic music where you have this highly individualized setups of everybody where we say, okay, it's a uh, laptop concert, but in fact what we hear is produced by a very individual software that somebody created or that somebody put together in the, for, for the means that he wants to reach with his music. And uh, it's similar with the, with the organs, also with the pipes that are made um, in different periods of organ, there are pipes that are made for the organ to sound more homogeneous, so you can melt all these uh, single pipes like in a synthesizer to one huge organ sound. But there are different periods in organ building where you had more uh, idea of like split tone, um, uh, split tone um, sound, so you so, so all the registers could not actually be played at the same time and sound like one thing, but there would be like uh, different instruments that uh, collide, and um, so all this customization, individualization, the synthesis is something that is, uh, and also of course what you saw I think in the picture before, or you can also see here, this elaborate control mechanisms that uh, that is built, like all these controllers and all this, you can see that the human um, way of playing the organ is, is tried to bring to its, to its max, you know, it's, uh, you have all these registers uh, and all the manuals that obviously not one player can play, but you can uh, put different sounds on each of these keyboards and have different uh, effects uh, by doing so. You can also, there is, uh, there are in most of the, uh, or many of the organs are also not only pipes, but also like percussion instruments, like uh, mallet instruments, like bells or even song uh, birds, birds sounds. So you have uh, a variety of sounds that you can approach with this instrument. I think in this point we start to explain a bit about the instruments we build. Um, so this is our newest instrument. Uh, it, we call it Specht. It's the German word for woodpecker. It has some predecessors while we are building instruments and um, this is how it looks in reality. Um, there are 
eight metal bars and you can hit them with solenoid, uh, solenoids and in two different modes. So you can hit them with the iron pin or with the, the other magnet to hit the same metal bar is prepared with a piece of felt so it sounds more dump and the other magnet if it hits the metal bar it sounds really harsh and clear. It's the instrument we started the concert yesterday uh, for those people who has, have been here. And um, it's the first instrument we um, developed in uh, the thinking of modules. So we built two meanwhile. And um, we are really happy with this. It, uh, this was the pre one of the predecessors of this instrument. So you can also see it's much smaller, it's much easier to carry and to be on the road. With. Um, this was the second predecessor, so um, it was even it was smaller than this, but uh, still big and a bit sloppy while playing it. And um, we wanted uh, it to hit the metal bars uh, much uh, faster, and um, so we put all our wishes into the new instrument. But this one exists not and doesn't exist anymore. These are pictures of the old version, so we, but we don't have this anymore. Um, this is the Fisharmonica, so you can yeah, tell Yeah, this about is the this. Fisharmonica. This is, the, this is an accordion-like instrument that we also don't have anymore. What you saw yesterday is like the next edition, kind of. This was made um, uh, on... Um, different levels which were also not working properly so it had to be rebuilt completely which you can see in the next picture i think or there, but there you can oh, yeah. see the wind machine okay but there you can see like so there is a wind machine like a compressor that, that generates like uh, air that like an accordion player would like move his arms and that uh, gives the air to the accordion Okay, and this is the new version. What you see here is like this box that gets all the air, and um, there are two wind chambers. Uh, or let's let's start from the outside. There are like all these um, all these red things you can see are solenoids or magnets that can open or close a valve. So you get one tone from um, like an accordion player would uh, press a hit, uh, press a button, but. Um, there is much more that is inside of this instrument, which is uh, what makes it... I mean, maybe talking about this, pressing the buttons, what is interesting about this instrument is it can play really, really fast, like so fast as no human can play, obviously. Actually, it can get so fast that the, the wind is becoming like a steady tone. So you can have, like in electronic music, you have these transitions between uh, state, um, stable tone and rhythmic impulse, which you can emulate quite well in an analog way with this instrument, which is what we are after also. And besides having all this um, abilities to play notes, it has uh, six motors built inside that can pro that can um, change the way the wind flows inside in the instrument. There are two wind chambers, and um, each wind chamber is. Uh, has its own uh, motor that is kind of can can reduce or um, re re yeah it can basically reduce the wind flow into this uh, uh, chamber. So there is the left you see the bass and the right you see the treble and mid registers that can be uh, triggered. And what you see here also quite good is, is are there re um, this um, metal bars or. Um, brass bars, uh, they are triggering, uh, there are six motors from the other side of the instrument that are um, triggering this, or that they are controlling this, and uh, it's like if you know accordion a little bit, you have knobs that are special, uh, knobs that change the sound of the instrument, that are like, uh, you can access a higher octave or a lower octave, uh, the registers or the stops, which change the uh, sound of the instrument dramatically. And uh, this is like one of the things that, that we ask Gerhard to do is to make these stops that you have in an accordion continuously. So you can not only change from the, the turn on or off the sound, but you can actually 
they get the sound in in a continuous way, like you would use an electronic filter to filter in more bass or more more treble. This is uh, like the, the connection that you can achieve with uh, the mixture of this uh, old technology and the um, computer controls. Um, yes, there you can see some more of the details of the of the motors inside. This is uh, the next instrument. It's called we call it bojo. It's a compound word of banjo and ebo. It has also a predecessor. Uh, we can show you this uh, soon. And um, it's uh, electromagnets that drive the strings, uh, the ebos, in the like middle of the construction. And uh, then there are stepper motors, and they move bottlenecks along the string to get the different tunes out of the string. And um, I don't know if it's so easy to discover, but there are also two motors uh, on the right and on the left side, and there are uh, some plectras attached, and you can hit the strings, so we can also get rhythmic patterns out of the instrument. Um, the predecessor of this instrument, it looked like this. Um, there you can see better like the starting point because the, the original idea was like starting from the monochord. And there we had like this big wooden box uh, with three pairs of strings and like this like um, wagon-like things um, moving over the strings to get the different pitches out of it. And um, But uh, this one works much better and it amplifies the sound also much better and is capable of a lot of more functions and yeah. Oh, yeah, this is also a very new instrument in our collection. So you want? Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, it's obviously a drum that has four uh, beaters on different uh, spots, so you get a different uh, attack on each of the spots. And in the center you have a special solenoid that can uh, also continuously change its um, strength, so you can uh, change the pitch of the drum's membrane, so you get uh, like on a... Um, uh, like on a tuned Pauke, um, um, timpani. Yes, thank you. Uh, like on a, on a uh, tuned timpani, you can you can change the pitch, so it's it's a little bit similar here. And uh, obviously, it can also go very very fast, and which is uh, one of the things that that we are looking for when we use this uh, technology. It's uh, you can go either very fast or you can go also very slow. These are two ways that the machines are capable of doing. You can uh, that uh, you know you can make very precise rhythms that are so slow that um, non drama could really get into this slow uh, thing. But also like you can get so fast that it's like a hyper drum roll that almost becomes uh, to the. Uh, to this point where your ear is not dividing different tones, but it's kind of melts into a single pitch. You can almost get there, and maybe if we improve it a little bit, you can really get there and make like this uh, also this transition from pitch to rhythmic impulse. Um, the last one <clears throat> are these three cabazas. <clears throat> <clears throat> driven by stepper motors, so they can rotate or they can also play via MIDI notes like rhythmic patterns. And it's uh, uh, the idea is like to build a noise generator with these things. So they work really very well. Um, so this is it about the music machines we built uh, until now. And from the technical side, uh, the whole system is driven by Ableton Live with Max for Life, where we write our own uh, like controllers. And um, all the instruments are MIDI driven. 
And the interesting thing about this for us is like um, the connection between the old and the new. Uh, it really meets in this place where you um, have like digital control of acoustic instruments that are me mechanically driven, and then led back through microphones to Marion's computer where she uh, treats them again. So you have like a whole cycle of uh, technology that goes around it, and. Um, the what what uh, I mentioned before this this thing of uh, pitch becomes rhythmic impulse so the continuity between two states and one continuity is also like uh, the uh, continuity between electronic music and acoustic music which you can see quite well in these instruments for example in a um, that there are not two worlds but it's just one world that is. Uh, that has a continuum between them. For example, if you think about this bow job that we showed you before, it's a string that is driven by an electro um, magnet that is driven by electricity, and then it drives the air that goes into your ear. And it's basically the same principle as a loudspeaker, who is a membrane that is driven by electromagnet that is driven by electricity. So it's basically almost the same principle, but you would not say that it's necessarily electronic music since it's a string that vibrates, that, that it makes the resonance on the body of an acoustic machine. So it's, uh, is it this one or is it this one? You really don't, cannot decide very clearly, which I find very interesting to get into these fields between these two worlds. Mm -hmm. um, I think we come to the last chapter of this uh, lecture today. Um, the theme uh, of the melding of human and technology, um, this accompanies us for quite some years. And uh, last year um, we did um, a music theater about uh, human and technology. It was uh, loosely based on a short story written by David Foster Wallace. to open this with two hands. So, and um, it was about uh, human and technology. And um, so the music machines formed like a technic totem. So it was like uh, the, the, the picture itself like presented this uh, melding of the old and the new. And uh, one performer was like rotating around this totem pole and uh, like being overwhelmed by technology. And um, we were like controlling the whole system like uh, from, the, from the outside of the triangle we built on stage. So um, what else do we have? I think... Yeah, I think this is kind of the end. What we could mention are some projects that are going to happen maybe, very maybe, soon. Or Maybe one last word about the old and the new. That it's like uh, the interesting thing about a seemingly outdated technology like this um, music machines. The interesting thing about it is that the, that the old technology comes back sometimes, but it has different forms. Like if you think about windmills that were really like died out and then came back as uh, to produce power. Uh, and or if you think about um, uh, yeah, and there, there, uh, if you think about this uh, moving doors that the Greeks had in these ancient Greek times, they, uh, the technology that they used is very similar to what, uh, what is a steam machine that was used then almost 2,000 years later to drive the whole industrial revolution, but they just kind of did not see the potential in the technology that they had at the time. So sometimes things come back and uh, create something completely different than it was before. Um, Maybe if you're in, if you're interested in this yeah. topic more in uh, in September we're gonna make a free day festival about robot music and uh, instrumental music where we will invite uh, ensembles from all over to present their work and composers to write new pieces for it. So thank you. Thanks.